Lovely. <laughs> so first of all, Lisa, would you like to introduce yourself and briefly tell us a bit about your career path to date? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, first of all, for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So I'm Lisa. Um, I've got a background in molecular biology. So I've done both a bachelor and a master's here in Germany. And then I moved to the UK, to the University of Cambridge to do my PhD. I've done my PhD at the MRC Lab of Molecular Biology. So for about four years, I called the Addenbrookes campus my second home, basically. Um, and I've worked on developmental genetics, cell biology, um, for my PhD and then continued that for just a few months in a very short postdoc in the same lab just to finish up some loose ties. And then I sort of decided I actually don't want to stick to the academic uh, career pathway. Um, and I wanted to change and I decided to go into, yeah, editing for a scientific journal. And so I'm now an associate editor with the BMC series, which is part of uh, Springer Nature. And I'm handling manuscripts for three different journals at the moment. Excellent, thank you. So it sounds like you've had a made a positive choice after your PhD to kind of move move into a different role outside of academia. And um, so tell us a bit about your day to day job, and can you describe what your role now involves? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, unsurprisingly, I guess in part of my day to day job is handling manuscripts. So, professional editor, we essentially chaperone the peer review process. So. Every um, new submission that lands on my desk, I do a sort of initial assessment just to check, does it meet the editorial threshold of my journal? Is it in scope for my journal? Um, is it roughly scientifically valid or is there any glaring the obvious problems with it? And if it meets these sort of criteria, I then search for suitable peer reviewers. So these are um, scientists in that field with a good track record, good publication record, in this particular area that can assess the manuscript for me that have the right expertise. And so I start to several reviewers and then wait for at least two, sometimes three reviewer reports to come back. And then based on these review, review reports, I make the decision on how to proceed with the manuscript, whether it can be accepted for public, whether revisions will be necessary or whether for whatever reason, there are fundamental issues that unfortunately preclude publication in our journals. Um, so that basically is really the main part of what I do on a day-to-day -day job. I would say that's probably roughly 85 to 90% of what I do in a day. Um, and apart from that, I also do journal development. So I'm in touch with the editorial board of my journal. We discuss what are the trends in the field right now, what, what new methods or new techniques are coming up, um, what's the hot topic in, in, in the different fields. Um, yeah, and try to develop and act new science to our mission reviews etc things like that excellent so it sounds like a really good opportunity to kind of see lots of different science in the field and see mm. what different people are doing and interact with lots of people Absolutely. who are yep. working there as well great and can you tell us because I think this is something that that quite a few people want to know about a role like yours how much do you get to interact with your colleagues versus how much time you kind of spend working independently mm. on, on your own work? Yeah, that's an important question. That's actually something that I was a bit cautious about when I started because I was wondering, am I just going to be sitting in front of my computer in my home office as well for the next few years, not interacting with anything much? And that's actually not the case at all. So I was really positively surprised by how much teamwork goes into that. So I would say that it depends very much on the journal you're working for, how much you discuss individual manuscripts. So for example, at a nature research journal, you do discuss um, a little bit more individual manuscript decisions, whereas in my journal group, because we are responsible for our own journals, I tend to make the decisions on the manuscripts myself with the help of the reviewers, of course, and if needed with editorial board members. But we otherwise discuss quite a lot in our teams, be that questions about how to make science more accessible, um, questions regarding ethics. We handle a lot of clinical journals. So obviously ethics questions are a big thing for us, um, which we tend to discuss with other team members. And just in general, it doesn't feel uh, alone at all. So um, we are quite international. So we've got editors in the Berlin, London, New York and Shanghai offices. So we're spread across um, continents even, um, which obviously means that it can be quite difficult to interact with certain team members because of time zones, but it actually works out really well. 
and we've been working virtually since long before COVID. So this is something that's really quite easy in my job, which I thought was really great that we're in touch with people from, from the different offices so easily. And I feel like I don't just interact with people from, from my journal group itself, but I also interact with editors from other Springer Nature journals. So both within the Berlin office where we've got a good lunch culture going, we go for drinks, et cetera, but also in the sense that Springer Nature um, has communities for different fields, let's say, so molecular biology or microbiology community. And in that editors from very different journals meet and interact and in invite speakers and discuss what's, what's going on in the field. And that's been really, really helpful to, yeah, get this interaction in and not just be sat in front of your computer all by yourself all day. Yeah, and I guess that's really positive that also the interaction, you know, if you're working from home, you get lots of opportunities exactly. to get to know your yeah. colleagues as well. Yeah, we still have coffee breaks and a very sociable chat as well. So it doesn't feel alone at all. Yeah, it's great. Oh, fabulous. So can you tell us a bit about what attracted you to working in scientific publishing in particular? Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably two things. I've always really enjoyed reading manuscripts. I know that that's something not everyone loves about being a research scientist because you do have to read manuscripts and <laughs> try to keep on top of the literature and I've always quite enjoyed doing that and and part of that is you know really looking at what have these other scientists done what kind of experiments have they done what have they not done what could have maybe helped strengthen their hypothesis or their conclusions um you know my experience that may have been missing from that is always something that I was you know thinking about when reading these manuscripts that's definitely the first reason and then Something I've noticed during my PhD is I was very much, you know, involved with one very specific, very narrow research field for four years. I was thinking nothing but wind signaling. And I know all the details. Well, not all the details. I know a lot of details about that very narrow field, but I've sort of, yeah, felt that I was missing out on other developments outside of my specific research project. And that's definitely something that as an editor, you kind of, you know, that comes with a job, you're forced to read um, outside of your um, specific area. So that's definitely a big reason for me why I wanted this change. Yeah, it sounds like it was a real positive that you, you kind of recognised something you enjoyed from your research background and identified how you could take that forward mm -hmm. in, in a very different kind of work environment as well. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So what would you say are the high points of your work? What do you enjoy about your role? Mm, seeing how a paper develops. So from the initial submission to the final manuscript that then gets ends up getting published, the, the, those two manuscripts can be quite different because the peer review process obviously gives so much input and the authors revise their manuscript based on the recommendations by the reviewers, sometimes quite substantially, um, which means that the end product can look quite differently from, from what we started out with. And it can be really you know, remarkable to see these changes and see how the authors interact with the reviewers and respond to their suggestions or their criticism, um, and then to see how it changes into the final product. Um, obviously, you know, I think the standard answer for a lot of editors to this question is hitting the sweet accept button, because obviously <laughs> it's great for us as well to be able to do that. Um, um, so, yeah, that's those are the things that I really value about my day to day work. And of course, there's there's manuscripts when I first get them on my um, on my desk and I think like this is really great I really want to see this published and then I'm really kind of like waiting on the edge of my seat to see what the reviewers say hoping that they're as positive about it as I am um, and then yeah, it's really gratifying to see when there's a you know something like that works out and I end up being able to publish it in my journal. Yeah it's nice to know that that you as an editor get just as excited about hitting that <laughs> accept button as people get get about sure. knowing it's been accepted that's a <laughs> behind the scenes tip. It's that a editors website, get exactly. <laughs> um, so obviously in your role you work with lots of different people and sometimes you'll have to communicate not necessarily kind of straightforward decisions to them as well so what would you say the challenges of your work might be? Yeah so that's an important aspect there. There are definitely decisions that are not straightforward that can be quite difficult, not just because rejecting is never fun, but also because sometimes you get opposing recommendations from reviewers. And then you kind of have to weigh up which recommendation do you follow? How do you decide if reviewers say opposite things? You know, sometimes that means involving a third or a fourth reviewer to 
to break that tie, so to say. Um, sometimes that involves, you know, discussing that particular manuscript with an editorial board member or with the colleague, etc. Um, but yeah, the, those are def there are definitely moments where I'm sat there thinking like, okay, what am I going to do with this manuscript? How are we going to resolve this issue? That's one thing. And then the other thing is, it is a busy job. I, you know, doing a PhD is like, quite stressful you you are constantly busy and I thought well I couldn't possibly get any worse and it's not worse but it is a different type of workload I would say it is very busy for sure but it is also a different responsibility I would say and I'm personally very well aware of the fact that each decision I make you know impacts somebody else whereas if you're doing a PhD or working in a research lab whether you do your experiment today or tomorrow is mostly your own problem. You know, your supervisor might not be entirely happy, but it's mostly on you and your collaborators. Whereas I obviously want to offer our uh, authors the best possible service. So I want to make decisions as quickly and as fairly as possible. And that can be quite you know, difficult at times. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you manage some of those challenges? Yeah, it always helps to take a step back and really, you know, sometimes I let it rest overnight and then try to clear my head and then look at it with a fresh view. Um, you know, like I said, adding a, another reviewer to sort of get a different opinion, see whether, you know, one of them falls on one side or the other can be helpful. And then just generally discussing it with, with team members or with other scientists in the field is very helpful. Yeah, it's great to have that supportive environment of other people you can go and yeah, speak absolutely. to. It's not all completely down to you. You can seek advice no. if you yeah, need exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it's really positive. Um, and I think one of the things that has come out of the pandemic, and, and you've touched on the fact you've been work, working virtually, and that's something you've done for quite a long time, but we know that that there are different factors influencing the work environment at the moment. And likely to continue on into the future so are there any particular factors that influence your role and how might your role change in the future as a result of some of that mm -hmm. so obviously I started during the pandemic so I've only known this job during COVID times um, from talking to my colleagues who've been around for longer I don't think it made a dramatic difference. So I have actually been going to the office relatively regularly over the last nine months, right? We've got precautions and social distancing and, and wearing masks, etc. And so it's worked out quite well in Berlin at least. Um, and other than that, like I said, we're so distributed across the world with different continents and different offices that a lot of what we've been doing has been virtual all along anyway. Um, so in that sense, I don't see too much of a difference for, for our job in particular. Um, there are, however, other challenges for the scientific publishing community. And I think there are um, many aspects that are currently being debated in the field, both with publishers as well as with the people doing the science. Um, aspects like accessibility of science, you know, open access, for example, um, things like how we um, construct the peer review process, because there's obviously still some issues with that, or um, people aren't entirely happy with how that's going at the moment. So there are different um, ideas out there and how to change these things and that will definitely impact my job as well but currently I think different publishers are trying out different ways and we're going to see in the next few years how that's going to end up and how that's going to impact on my job. Yeah absolutely I know anyone who's in in any way connected to academic publishing is probably aware of some of those things and it's interesting exactly, yeah. to know that it's very much a developing picture and who Absolutely, knows what yeah. the next few years will hold <laughs> around that, but hopefully some positive kind of shifts. Yeah, oh, I think it would be exciting to see what comes out of it. Yeah, what, what kind of approaches work and what maybe don't work so well. It would be interesting to see how that works, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on a little bit more to kind of your your own career path. So you, as you've mentioned, completed a PhD and very briefly worked, worked as a postdoc. What prompted you to explore a career change and how did you manage this transition from being an academic researcher and moving into to scientific publishing? Mm. Um, so I think everyone who works in academic research is well aware of the sort of struggles that people um, have to go through in trying to maintain an academic research pathway, you know, ending up as a PI at an institute somewhere is very, very difficult. Um, there's you know, not as many 
um, open positions as there are people applying for them, um, which means that it is highly competitive. And a lot of whether or not you're successful in doing so is not down to hard work or talent. It's also very much down to luck and having supportive supervisor relationships. And that's not something everyone can bank on, I would say. Um, so I, I, I just saw a lot of people struggling with academic research careers. And I just decided that I would prefer to have a different pathway for my career. Um, and I think scientific publishing is sort of the best of both worlds because you do have a more company environment. So you do have different structures and different um, you know, ways of moving up as well. And um, you still interact very, very closely with, with scientists around the world, right? Maybe even closer than you do as a, as a scientist yourself. Um, so I thought that was the, the best of both ways. And in terms of transitioning, I actually thought that the transition was relatively easy. I felt very supported by, first of all, the people in my lab environment at the time, but also then starting my new job here in terms of training, etc. Um, I really felt very well supported and it was quite straightforward to transition out. Yeah. And also, maybe I should mention this at this point, um, I don't think that career pathway has to be linear and I don't personally feel stuck in the scientific publishing world now. Um, I do know that there are people who change back into academic research or into the biotech company etc after a few years in publishing so it's not like this is absolutely linear and what you choose after your PhD is what you're going to do for the rest of your life so there's always you know it's a fluid you can always change if you wanted to. Yeah, I think that's a really good and important thing to, to pick up around, make the decision that's right for you at the end of your PhD or postdoc contract, whatever stage you're, you're at. Yeah, but exactly. it's not and a, that might be different, different to what you've set out with. Like when I started my PhD, I was definitely more interested in, in following the academic pathway. Um, but I've just noticed after four and a half years of, of doing PhD and postdoc work, maybe that's not quite what I want now. So it's important to bear that in mind and keep an open mind, yeah. Yeah, that's really good advice to keep that open mind, keep it, just keep an eye on what's on the horizon mm -hmm. and also be prepared that, you know, that you can change career at any point and that option doesn't change just because exactly. you've made one career change already, you can do it again. That's exactly right, yeah. It's good to hear. So whilst you were at Cambridge, um, was there anything that you did that helped you to explore um, moving into scientific publishing further? And how did some of those activities help you to get where you are now? Mm. Well, I think Cambridge is a great place for networking and interacting with people of different backgrounds and also different career pathways. So a lot of my colleagues who have done my PhD with or who were postdocs while I was doing my PhD have now moved on to very different careers in or outside academic research. And, um, that's definitely something I would take advantage of again, you know, if I was going to do another PhD, um, just to look out for what other people are doing, try to attend as many careers events as possible. I mean, we organized one at the LMB because we thought that, you know, it would be interesting to invite certain people. And absolute certainty that when I started my PhD, I was not aware of some career options. I wasn't really sure what consulting would be. I never really considered policy as a, as a career choice. Um, and so definitely keeping this open mind and, and looking at interacting with people of different backgrounds was super, super beneficial for me in making that decision. Um, so I've talked to several um, editors during my time at Cambridge, sort of to hear what, what their experiences are. How did they move into the job? For example, one big question for me was, do I have to do an independent postdoc in order to become an editor? Is that crucial or not? And there's also different opinions on that and might also depend very much on what journal you're aiming for. Um, so it's definitely something to, to, you know, keep an eye out and invite people. If that's not something that's already happening, you take initiative and you invite the people yourself. I mean, at Cambridge, everyone wants to come and talk at Cambridge, right? It's relatively easy to get all the speakers to come to you to so definitely take advantage of that and then make it happen. So that's been really helpful for me. Yeah, absolutely. And really good advice about, you know, if if you're not seeing the people you want to hear from, organize an event and invite them. I've, I've attended LMB careers events and, and exactly. there's always some fantastic speakers. So definitely check those out. And just as a career service plug, we have something called Alumni Careers Connect, where you can search for Cambridge alumni and get in touch mm -hmm. with them. Um, so if you're starting to kind of find that network of people, that's another way 
that you can do it along with you know talking to people who've left your own research group and and people Mm. you've been in touch with in the past definitely really great thanks so you touched on this earlier around how well supported you were when you first started your role Mm -hmm. so what what was the training like for you um when you first started in your current role and and what kind of support were you given Mm -hmm. yeah so like I said, I felt very well supported. Then it depends a little bit on the journal, what your training schedule looks like in detail. But in general, um, I did a lot of training with my line manager and my direct teammates. Uh, uh, there was sort of a training schedule in the very beginning of points that I had to tick off, um, which was obviously very important to get to know the general, how, to, how do you assess a manuscript as an editor, which is actually not that much different to how you uh, assess a manuscript as a scientist, because you, you do look for the same, same sort of questions, right? Um, so that's something we're already inherently trained in after doing a PhD. Um, and then I was relatively early on sort of thrown headfirst into assessing my own manuscripts um, and then working relatively independently, I think, from like the second week on or something like that, where I would handle my own manuscripts and um, do the initial assessment and propose reviews and then go and discuss them with my line manager to see what she would think, if she had a different input, different advice, et cetera. Um, and that was really helpful to learn on the job because in the end, there's a lot of questions that you come up that come up during manuscript assessment that you can't really foresee and that's still happening after nine months right like even um, specific questions about ethics or authorship changes or research integrity all of these sort of things they still keep cropping up so it's not like my training is finished now I still have ample opportunity to ask for support and ask for help um, and yeah discuss these things with my team and uh, team members so it's yeah it was a very easy transition it was definitely a lot of support and I mean they're used to people transitioning out of academia into publishing so people are fully aware of of what we need to learn in the first few months. That's good and it's good that you were able to kind of get started in the role quite quickly but with that support to check things out and that that's continued like as you've gone on so. Is it, It is quite daunting doing the first few manuscripts and you know actually sending off a decision is it's it's a big task so I was quite happy that I was able to do it myself but then discuss it with my line manager first before actually hitting send on any decisions in the first months or so yeah that's great it's one of those things that you don't always know what questions you have until you start doing something so once you get started it's good that support is there for you to ask all of those questions Mm. that you could never predict may come up as well exactly and that's that's still ongoing right my my older team members that are senior editors do the same still right there's always questions that we're not prepared for that we have to discuss as a team that's just a normal part of the job I would say yeah that's good and hopefully reassuring for anyone who's thinking about this as a a next step as well you don't need to be an expert before you start (laughs) (laughs) and like I said in some journals it's even more interactive um, where you really look at the, the individual manuscripts as a team rather than as a single editor so that very much depends on which journal you're with. Absolutely so could you you obviously completed your PhD and and had a short postdoc so do you have any particular advice for for PhDs or postdocs who are exploring a career change away from academic research? Yeah I mean we've basically already said that I think the main issue is and I I think that sort of has been changing slightly over the last few years but in general academic researchers seem to see alternative careers oftentimes as maybe less valuable or less exciting and there seems to be this pressure for PhD students and postdocs to continue on this path Um, I at least felt pressured into this for for a little while so it's very important to forget that entirely and just you know think of what you want to do and there's many many options out there many that we don't even know about so really You know, like I said earlier, uh, networking and talking to people who have gone down different pathways is super crucial to that. Um, And just, yeah, remembering that there are different options and these could possibly be a lot better for you than academic research even. Yeah, I think that's a really good piece of advice. Think about what you want and see how well different career paths match up to that to work out which is going to be best for you as an individual. And again, you don't have to feel stuck in anything, even if you then decide publishing is maybe not for you after a few months. 
that's fine, make another change. I mean, you know, it's not like we have to decide what we want to do in our early 20s and then be stuck with it for the rest of our lives. So that's just, I think that's the most important thing to bear in mind. It's not linear. And even if you transition out of academia, there's, there might be a way back in if that's what you decide in a few years. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really reassuring thing to, to hear from, from you. Um, so you're currently an associate editor. What do the career opportunities look like for someone in your role kind of moving forward into the future? Mm-hmm. Right. So the next logical step for me would be to apply for a promotion to um, senior editor, which is something most people do roughly after the two years of working as an editor. I would say that's sort of the benchmark, probably. Um, senior editor is pretty much the same role as associate editor, maybe with slightly more responsibilities and a pay rise, um, but otherwise relatively similar. And then obviously beyond that, there's um, then positions that require leadership. For example, you could be a line manager for a smaller team um, and you could also become editor in chief for a whole journal, right? These are the sort of the options um, staying in in scientific publishing. But then I think the the main important thing is um, to remember that you can always also change between journals. So I'm currently working for the BMC series, but maybe in the future I would like to employ other journals as well, just to see how they're working, to explore different topics, because obviously now I'm working on clinical journals. Maybe at some point in the future, I would like to um, work more in basic research again. Things like that are usually possible. And there's oftentimes options out there to explore these these sort of changes. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess for, for someone who's kind of new to the, the careers in, in scientific publishing, um, what support do you get if you're someone who wants to develop your career in this area? What what kind of support can you access to help you with that? I mean, so because I'm still relatively at the beginning, I'm also still figuring some of that out. Um, I would say that talking to your senior colleagues and seeing what they've done to progress um, is very important. There are obviously certain things that you are meant to do in order to get promoted to, for example, senior editor. There are some boxes that you need to tick in order to get that um, and it's definitely a good idea to look at what these things are early on um, and, and pursue that. Interacting with your colleagues in, in terms of our research communities for example is an important part of that. Um, there's loads of workshops and, and classes that we can take internally that are very important to sort of you know um, strengthen your CV and learn new skills um, whether that be a leadership or you know other skills that you might want to pick up there's there's definitely a lot of opportunity at least in entrepreneur nature to do that that's great and it sounds like you know there's there's lots of possible things that you can do and engage with and you mentioned things like workshops and classes so Mm. it's good to highlight that for people who are interested so that they can ask questions perhaps before applying to different publishers or learn more about that when thinking about where it might be right for them. Exactly. I think one of the the best advice that I've actually received, even though I didn't end up following that route, but um, one of the things you can do if you're unsure whether scientific publishing might be the right career for you is to apply for a locum position. So these are maternity covers, for example, that means temporarily limited, but it's a good way of getting to know the day-to-day work of, a, of an editor. And that might be really important for someone who's maybe not quite sure whether that's the right sort of career for them, because that really gives you like a good six to nine months to find out. Um, and at the end of that, you can then oftentimes also apply for jobs in publishing with the experience already, which is very helpful. So that's certainly some advice I would give people who are unclear on what they might want to do. Oh, that's an excellent um, insider tip for people to look out for, for, for getting started. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and finally, to kind of round off our, our conversation today, um, what one piece of advice would you give to someone who's looking to move into scientific publishing? Yeah, reach out to us. I mean, a lot of journal editors, you can just email us through the journal's website, get in touch and ask us what we what you know we'd be happy most of us will be really happy to meet with you for a zoom call i've actually done that a couple of times before i applied um just to get an idea you know ask different people and i would also suggest to ask people from different publishers of different journals to get an idea what the differences are because obviously there are differences and then every individual has their own sort of 
experience and their own point of view. And it's it was really, really helpful to hear from different people what sort of what they think is great about their job, maybe also what they think is difficult. Um, they ask you questions that are really telling on, on the sort of things that you might have to bring to the job as well. So it's really important to take these questions and reflect on, is this really something that I would be good at? Would I enjoy that? That's been really, really helpful. So just reach out to people, use the alumni um, network through Cambridge, for example, um, and just generally, yeah, talk to us. <laughs> Yeah, that's some really good advice. And I guess by having those conversations, not only can it help someone to reflect on whether this job is right for them, but also to reflect on where they've developed and used those skills mm -hmm. before and start mm -hmm. thinking about how they might present their experience as part of the application because they've spoken to exactly. someone in the role like yeah. you. They can hear a bit more about what it's really like and think, okay, well, here's an example of how I've dealt with having a tricky conversation with somebody or mm. you know communicating effectively with lots of people from different backgrounds yeah. and and they can then start to think okay how can I make my application kind of fit for this kind of role or develop and highlight things yeah. from my academic experience as well exactly and of course networking always helps in, in knowing people in that role already so if if you know a position pops up that you might be interested in and you see oh it's in the same journal group person X work for who I've been in touch with, maybe I should ask them about that specific role. Maybe they can give me advice. That can be super helpful, of course, in getting interviewed as well. Yeah, absolutely. It can certainly help with tailoring the application as specifically exactly. as possible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, Lisa, thank you very much for your, your time today. We really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk about your, yeah. your role now and, and what you're doing. And um, Before we finish um, today, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered or talked about? No, I think we've, we're good. I think we've talked about a lot of things. Um, I would just say I'm really happy with the career change I've made um, and I don't regret doing it, even though definitely there are challenges as with every job. And I'm still very happy to have um, transitioned into scientific publishing. And, you know, if anyone wants to reach out to me personally, please feel free. It's very kind of you. And thank you very much. And thank you again for taking the Thanks time for to, to share. Thank you.